Mr. McCoy back with Deep and Dark and Dangerous, Part 27. You have to believe us, Emma put in. We promised Sissy. Please, Mom added, let the girls show you the place. Send a diver down. It can't hurt to look. Think of it this way, Dad said, still joking. If the kids are right, you'll have a great story, probably the biggest you'll ever stumble onto in Webster's Cove. Mr. Nelson rubbed his jaw. I could almost hear his thoughts. National news, Pulitzer Prize, TV talk shows, a best-selling book. On the other hand, I could make a fool of myself, become the butt of jokes, a laughing stock, never live it down. You've got a point, he told Dad. Pulling a cell phone out of a pocket, he said, I'll call the police. A moment later, he said, Hello, Neil? This is Dan Nelson from the Sentinel. I'm at Gull Cottage doing a recap about the girl who drowned back in the late 70s. A slight pause. Yes, Teresa Abbott, he went on. The kids here say they know where her body is. Another pause, a little longer this time. I'm not sure they know, but I think it's worth following up. Maybe you could send a diver? A pause again. Mr. Nelson spoke, spoke a little louder. Uh, what have you got to lose? When he hung up, his face was somewhere between pleased and worried. They're sending a diver. He should be here in a half hour or so. Next, he called the paper and asked for Ed Jones, the reporter who'd interviewed Dulcie. Got something here you might be interested in, he said. I could hear Ed Jones's voice, but not what he was saying. I'll tell you this much, Mr. Nelson went on. It involves the Abbott girl's remains. A hint of the supernatural. I'll be right there, Mr. Jones shouted into the phone. The supernatural is Ed's thing. Mr. Nelson grinned at Dad as if to suggest they were linked by common sense and logic. I keep telling him he should get a job with one of the rags, the National Enquirer, maybe. While we waited for the police and Mr. Jones to show up, Mr. Nelson photographed us in a number of poses, both inside and outside, even included a few shots of Dad looking skeptical. When Dulcie showed him the photo of herself, Mom, and Teresa, he borrowed it to make a copy. Mom grimaced at the sight of it. You should have destroyed that. Or at least removed Teresa, Dulcie. Dulcie shrugged. History's history. You can't change it by destroying a picture. Turning away, she busied herself making a fresh pot of coffee. There ought to be a pound cake in the pantry, she told me. Why don't you get that out and fix some blueberries to go with it? I picked a quart yesterday. By the time the policeman arrived, followed closely by Mr. Jones, we'd all fortified ourselves with cake and blueberries, coffee for the adults, and lemonade for Emma and me. When she saw the officer at the back door, Dulcie grabbed Mom's hand. For a moment, they looked like little girls clinging to each other, scared and anxious. Neither spoke. They just stood there, holding hands, waiting for what would happen next. Before the policeman had a chance to introduce himself, a black sedan braked to a sharp stop, and a woman I'd never seen jumped out. It's Linda, Mom whispered. Dulcie held her hand tighter. Sissy's sister came into the kitchen like a blast of wind. Her curves had rounded out, but her hair was still blonde, and she wore plenty of lipstick. You never fooled me, she cried. I knew all along you were in the canoe with Sissy. So what do you think's going to happen next in this scene? Share your prediction with your fellow listeners. Mom began to apologize, but Dulcie broke in before she finished. It was an accident, she said. We never meant to harm Sissy. We were just kids. We... Sissy was just a kid, too. Linda looked at me. Younger than her. Why didn't you tell the truth? 
Do you know how much grief you've caused us? Rich people coming here, acting like they're above the law. Well, you should be arrested. You should pay for what you did to my sister. The policeman took Linda's arm and gave it a gentle squeeze. Now, now, Linda, that's enough. I told you not to come out here. I'm not planning to make any arrests or press charges. I just want to get some things straight. Somehow he managed to calm Linda down. Then he turned to Mom and Dulcie and introduced her, himself. I'm Captain Wall, he said. I understand you have some new information about Teresa Abbott's remains. The diver's coming by boat, but I thought we could have a little chat before he starts looking. I wanted to hear what Mom and Dulcie and Linda had to say, but Captain Wall told Dad to take Emma and me outside. I'll talk to the girls later. A motorboat was already tied up at the dock. A man in a wetsuit stood with his back to us, gazing out at the lake. It was one of those rare sunny days and the water had never looked bluer. Emma clung to Dad's hand. Is he going to find Sissy? Dad squeezed her. His Dad squeezed her hand, his face skeptical. Maybe. A few minutes later, Captain Wall joined us. The others trailed behind, Mom and Dulcie close together, Linda a few steps back, clearly separating herself from them. The reporter and photographer brought up the rear, heads together, exchanging opinions. Captain Wall took Emma and me aside. Tell me again how you know where the body is. It's just bones, Emma whispered. Yes, right. Captain Wall nodded and wrote something in a little notebook, but how do you know where the bones are? Sissy told us. Sissy's Teresa's ghost, I added. Emma and I have seen her lots of times. Honest, we have. Last night she told us both where her, where she is. I couldn't bring myself to refer to Sissy's bones or her skeleton. A ghost? He nodded and made a few more notes. I knew he didn't believe us, but he played along as if he did. Will you show me where you think her bones are? Emma and I set out along the path. Captain Wall called down to the diver to follow in his boat. With Linda on her, our heels, and the others close behind her, we made our way to the high point Sissy had taken me to. More fearless than I, Emma walked to the edge and pointed down. See those three big rocks? That's where the bones are. Captain Wall peered down at the calm water. You're sure, honey? Sissy told me. She told Allie, too. I nodded. This is the place. Captain Wall signaled, and the diver anchored his boat and slipped into the water. He was gone a long time. Did he drown? Emma asked. He has an oxygen tank, I told her, so he can breathe under the water. At last, the diver came to the surface. I don't know how the girls knew called up to the captain. But the bones are there. Linda began to cry. If only mom and dad were still alive. If only they knew she's been found. Dulcie and mom cried too. But dad stood there like a man in shock. The photographer looked stunned as well. His and dad's concept of the world had suffered a serious blow. In contrast, the reporter grinned broadly. Captain Wall was the only one to speak. Incredible, he said. Emma took my hand and pointed. Look, she whispered. In the shadows under the pines, Sissy gave a thumbs up and vanished before anyone else saw her. Dad reached out for Emma and me. Let's go back to the cottage. So there's still a little more coming for today, but what do you think is coming up next? Share with your fellow listener.
The rest of the day dragged slowly past. Emma spent most of it sleeping, exhausted. I guess by all that had happened, the policeman left, still puzzled. With a few more nasty comments, Linda departed as well. The photographer and Dad sat on the deck trying to find explanations, other explanations for the discovery of Teresa Abbott's remains. The reporter sat near them, still grinning and typing away on his laptop. In the end, all three were left with the possibility that Emma and I had truly seen a ghost. Live action news showed up in the afternoon along with most of the population of Webster's Cove. Tourists tramped through the yard and followed the trail to the cliff top, snapping pictures of everything with their little cameras. We were interviewed all over again by the TV reporter and videotaped by their photographers. The media people insisted on waking Emma so they could talk to both of the girls who saw the ghost. Tired and cranky, Emma clung to Dulcie and cried. I overheard the reporter say in a hushed tone, Four-year-old Emma, traumatized, clearly traumatized by her encounter with the supernatural, sobs in her mother's arms. Fed up, I sneaked into the woods. Safe from reporters and tourists, I sat down and leaned against a tree trunk. They all know now, sissy, I said to myself. Everyone in the state of Maine, and probably the rest of the country, too. Sissy stepped out from behind the tree, cradling Edith in the crook of her arm, her silvery hair bright against the gloomy woods. With a sigh, she sank onto the mossy ground beside me, closed her eyes, and rested her head against the tree. Are you okay? I asked. Sissy yawned. Just tired, she murmured. Really, really tired. All those people running around asking questions, taking pictures, even when they can't see you. Being famous is hard on a person. I couldn't take it anymore either, I confessed. That's why I'm hiding in the woods. Do you think they'll bury me soon? Asked Sissy. Do you think they will be burying Sissy soon? The answer to that and other unanswered questions as we move into the next part of Deep and Dark and Dangerous. I know you'll be there because great things are still to come.